Oh, just hung over. How early is too early for the first beer of the day? Uh, it depends how much you drank the night before. It used to be never. Yeah. But now I'm getting older, trying to take the more responsible approach. So you know, I'm gonna just have one or two before I play. At the most. I'm not a partier. I felt like a wet blanket for those guys sometimes. I just like I just want to go to bed, check my computer. I suppose my grandfather and my uncle used to play guitar to me when I was a baby until I was like, you know, like four years old. And so the first time I picked up a guitar, I felt like kind of comfortable and natural. I was really young, I was like seven or eight years old. I started like trying to play. And I was a troubled kid though. I like, they did a lot of crime. Yeah, I was in juvenile hall for a while. And they put me in military school. I was just stealing a lot of stuff and selling it and being a little punk. Stealing people's bikes and skateboards, and making one of those people that learned their lesson. I don't believe in fucking people over, so I'm trying to be the nicest guy I can. Ten, ten. Bukaki, Bukaki, Bukaki. <laughs> Do you and Dez argue much? No, not really. Never have, really. I mean, well, we've been in arguments, yeah. yeah. But, and, you know, he's my partner in crime. Sweet, my mini birds. Yeah. Those are really mini. I'm cool. I mean, with Thrones, I'd be out on tour for at least four months out of the year. That seems like a fair amount of touring to me. After my own fire, it's just like, Jesus, it's nothing. I'm pretty much gone for at least eight months out of the year. It felt like it completely ground me down into paste, pretty much, and pretty quickly, too. I got a call from Hank 3 one day, actually, saying, hey, you know, these guys need a bass player. We should uh, maybe give them a call. Jeff was pretty bitching right off the bat. But I was just like, uh, well, we'll probably try other people, and I'm promising you anything or nothing, but... Went down and jammed with them a couple of times, and it seemed to work really well. I was really glad to be in my own fire. That's kind of the first bands that I really felt like I took the chance to commit to in a long time. It was definitely a pleasure playing with them, like playing music with them, getting to share space with them. First show? Well, let's see. 
I think I prepared for it by doing about seven shots of Jameson. I think you have to be kind of weird and somewhat crazy to be in this van. Are you able to like sustain yourself doing high and fire? Usually, yeah. I don't do that bad. <laughs> Lawn decorations out here. I'm not rich by any means, but uh, I definitely, that's all I do, but I put a lot of work. It's like having a job, you know? Well, I've worked in uh, several different kitchens for a company removing lead paint from freeway overpasses and uh, bridges. You know, if I'm not on tour, I ain't making shit. I'm spending all the money that I made during the tour, you know, so. I'll tell you what, man, San Francisco is not a city to be a fucking bike messenger unless you like riding your bikes up hills. Me and Matt had a job where it just seemed like all we did all day is just dig trenches. You're selling yourself in a weird way, which I hate to say that, you know, it's kind of lame, but you are, you're selling yourself to people so that they buy your product. That has nothing to do with the music you're writing inside of, you know, they might like it, but yeah, there's a whole different thing that, like, if you want to make money in music, it's all about merchandising. I really like playing uh, Bless Black Wings, stuff off of the last record. I think Bless Black Wings is the most personal one I've made. It's definitely a challenge for me to learn that stuff. Yeah, I usually like it to be kind of a secret people to figure out what I'm saying. I don't know, most of it's like stuff that I'm going through. Combined with films, books, art, situations, stories that make up in my head. You know, life sucks for everyone, but you know, I'm not some uh, you know, like emo dude bitching about it. We don't put generic shit in our songs just because it, you know, sounds radio friendly or it's this amount of time or that amount of time. We just do what, uh, what we feel. We want everything to be like immaculately pretty uh, intense.
pressure and torture around my head. Personal suffering, I believe, makes it, you know, the soul shine brighter and understand more about the world, you know, we live in before, you know, we have to certainly face death. And uh, I think it's a real important thing to pay attention to that every day. myself in front of 8,000 people. <laughs> Tell that story. It fucking made me play harder because I got rid of it. Like, and it pissed me off and it made me make the most metal face I ever made in my life, probably. Because, yeah, and, you know, I was drinking whiskey all night or something and had the squirts and you're up there and then there's just that moment where you're all, dude, I really need the John right now. And I just let it go. <laughs> Fuck it. And threw my underwear in the trash when I got done, you know, took a shower or whatever. Great. But, yeah, I let it go and it was like in Montreal in front of tons of people and on the sounds of the underground tour. You know, the show must go on if you make crappy when you're on me. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness, thank you guys so much. We had fun jamming. We were on fire from that and see us. Two inch, 24 track tape machine. <laughs> it's tape. So we're hard at work working on a new record, as you can see. Yep. This is it. Leather couches. Sounds good. Sounds great. Sounds great. Me eyes are burning. She's sick of me. And I'm not leaving. Our secret Los Angeles recording studio. You can see all the fine bands that have recorded here. You've got Jackson Joe Wolf FX, Link, The Crystals, Link 182, Francis. We thought we'd jump on that bandwagon. It's the next link in the chain. Punk's not dead, it just sucks now. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. It just sucks now. That's uh, 11 songs in 13 days? Yep. Is that right? That's right. It's a dollars and cents thing. <laughs> <laughs> you know. We don't have any dollars and we don't got no cents. That's right. Just make sure you get that on there. That's very impressive. It's very impressive. Well, we just, you know. It's fucking incredible. It's fucking it's incredible. Talking earlier about, about how, how how could a band possibly spend six months in a studio? Or in some cases. You could. Like Metallica. Years. Six years in the studio. Six yeah. years in the studio. To come up with a piece of crap. <laughs> <laughs> Six years in the studio to come up with a piece of crap. We can come up with a piece of crap in just 13 days. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Let's do it, Willis. All right. Okay. We got other bands to deal with. Check you guys that? later. Should get some FaceTime in. Yeah. All Jeez. day. <laughs> now that they're gone. Yeah, you know, really uses this thing a lot. Hey, Alexa, check it out. Turn up the crap, turn it up. Okay. Who's it?
<laughs> See you guys. Yeah. We fired our bass player Kevin, and we're looking for somebody new. And uh, my wife actually brought up, "Why don't you? What, what about Jared?" You know, and I said to Buzz, "What about Jared?" And he said, "What about Jared and Cody?" <laughs> I was really ready to do something different. Yeah. After this much time, you know. Certainly. We don't need another drummer, and that's why we should do it. <laughs> Yes, we do. We need another one because I'm getting old and, you know, my bones are getting brittle. Um, it would help a lot if Dale's drums weren't in the in the headphones. More? That. If Dale's drums were not in the headphones because he's playing against the beat. I think you're going to hear it no matter what because it's going to be leaking. Uh, okay. Well, I hate it. <laughs> <laughs> We'll give you the cue, okay? okay. I don't know. <laughs> oh my God. It's good. It's good. <sighs> this is how we mix records. Put the headphones on. Yeah. Turn the lights off. <sighs> Turn up the vocal! <laughs> Turn up the kick drum! What? We were on the very last Nirvana tour, and Dave Grohl had come out and played a couple songs with us. We were playing in, in Germany. On the next show, he was going to play the whole set with us. And that's the shows that got canceled, and and that was when Kurt went to Rome and and OD'd or tried to commit suicide the first time or whatever. After all that stuff with Nirvana happened, um, and and Kurt ended up killing himself, we had talked to Dave and we're like, well, why don't you? Do you want to come and just play with us? You know, like try to forget about this stuff that's happening and and try to have some fun playing music. You know, he was really into it. Um, until we never heard from him again <laughs> about it. And then he formed the Foo Fighters, and, and, and that's that. Where is it? Uh, it's in that breakdown part, the doo 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 doo. Oh, okay. <laughs> The songs are buzzes. He's just a little writing machine. He always has been. There's never been any such thing as like a, a writer's block with him. He's always had tons of songs. A lot more vocals on this, you know. Um, Jared's a really good singer. His voice and Buzz's voice go together really well, and it's almost like he sings in a similar style, but like his range is a little bit higher. Yeah, I sing more on this record than I have on any other Melvin's record. There's like lots of three-part harmonies. This was a really good way for us to reinvent ourselves after, you know, 22 years. You know, a long time for a band. It's always cliche to say like, oh, this is our best record, but you know, I think this is definitely gonna be up there with one of our best. It's gonna be called A Senile Animal. Listen in the car. Track. Listen to the truck. Truck! Van. Van! Van, ah, okay. Van, bitch! It was like a joke when we started. Like, it was like, oh, ha ha, let's call the band of Bronx, you know, and then all of a sudden it just, like, I don't know, it just happened. You gotta understand how weird that is. Playing in bands your whole fucking life and then you play two shows and you have like 11 record labels wanting to give you a record deal. The first one was at three clubs, not even in the big room at three clubs. Put the drums, you know, where you walk in from, the, right, we played right in front of the bar. I mean, and it's like, I wouldn't even call that a show. It's just a, it's just a riot. I mean, it's just, people just started going crazy. You know, I, you couldn't see what you were playing and everything got trashed. I think we played six songs and it just, the place exploded. Somebody has very cleverly tied my shoe.
to the microphone cord. It looks like you win. Whoever you are, you win. Why did you decide to add another member? There's certain songs we couldn't play because it was just, you know, dependent on other guitar parts. I'm just accumulating all this gear to have to use guitars with different tunings. There's acoustic strings on it, you know, it's <laughs> tuned all funky. Right and, on. You know, it's just, it's getting, just got ridiculous. You know, I've been a big fan of the Bronx for a while, good friends with them, and, you know, I've been relearning guitar for the last two weeks. It's kind of a, a never-ending process. Like, now we're still changing songs that, you know, are laid down, you know, on CD or vinyl. You know, they're all great players. They've been really cool about, you know, giving me different parts. The three of us, uh, Jorma, Joby, and I were all friends before we started in the band together, and our friendships have endured, you know, through that. And then when Matt came in, I mean, Matt's a pretty likable guy. Matt and I have been in bands for Seven years, probably, I guess. He had to go to the doctor, so he's just he's been having some, some vocal problems. He has an aggressive singing style, but he also has an aggressive uh, lifestyle.
a normal tour a van works just fine we don't have to drive overnight we get hotel rooms we can spread out there's two vehicles so everybody doesn't have to be all together and it's fine so you know this is cool and i'm enjoying it while it lasts but you know. we only have a really 35 minutes half hour to play so we figured we'd just cut right to the chase with the songs we selected. All of our songs are lo long and boring. We just tried to pick the ones that are less <laughs> long and less boring, so. Other than a few smattering, like, moments of negative comments, generally it's been, people have been fairly enthusiastic, seemingly so. I mean, from my vantage point anyway, and it's been, you know, a lot more than I ever expected. Yeah, I mean, people have been cheering, like, you know, during breakdowns of songs and between songs, and you know, we expect either a dead silence or b yeah. booing. So yeah, it's been, you know, it's cool. cool. Like I mean, I, I can't deny the fact that like you know, when we finish a song and I hear, you know, at least half an arena of people cheering, that it, it gets me psyched. You yeah, know, it's great. I mean, it really it's is. Rewarding. It's it is rewarding. Mm -hmm.
shelter studio in Los Angeles making what is our fourth album. <laughs> We actually played our own instruments this time yeah. instead of hiring a ghost band to do everything for us. There was uh, monkeys on the last one. Monkey monkeys, yeah. So. yeah, that was all we could afford. And I'm not objective, so I may not be the best person to ask, but I feel like <laughs> everyone is, is playing off each other better than ever. When writing their parts or whatever, they were really listening to what the whole was and then adding to that to make it a more uh, moving piece. <laughs> It just needs to, the vocals in general just need to be a little quieter there. Like, yeah, I thought it could. What? A little bit. I think I'm, I'm, I agree with your kick statement throughout. Mm -hmm. I was a more closely to that. Other than those few little things, I think it sounds pretty good. I've been working on uh, a lot of drawings for the layout and. It's a little bit scary because I don't know if my bandmates are gonna like it. I'm trying to make it a little bit different from the last couple of releases because they've all been photo based and rather austere in a way, and I want this one to to reflect the the album and the change in the music. I didn't print the lyrics. There's one quote that was printed in there from a, another source that I think is, you know, sort of encapsulates a lot of the uh, a lot of the subject matter, or at least what I'm attempting to communicate. Where everything kind of. At the beginning, I think it might be okay. This section, it definitely needs to hit a little harder. And Jeff goes down to a low note there, okay. which, when we're playing it, is the thing the that makes me. In? Yes, which okay. is the thing that makes me feel like the section's stepping up a bit. American show ever for Radio Birdman. Yeah. For Radio Birdman, and we broke up because we were um, we socially disintegrated in the first instance. No, we haven't changed much at all. You know, dickhead at six, dickhead at sixty. I think is the <laughs> is, is the expression that sort of covers it. Well, I got into started in bands. So I wanted to sing because of the New York Dolls first album, and and I just latched on to Funhouse and all this stuff. The Stooges had a whole atmosphere under themselves. I don't think any bands ever actually. Sort of a lot of bands have tried to be like the Stooges, and they don't come anywhere near it. You, you have to maintain some sort of control. And when we started, that was the only way to go about it: was make your own decisions, generate the interest from your gigs and word of mouth and stuff by being who you are. I have one question way. for you, Dennis. Yeah. Is it true that that um, the character Iceman from Top Gun is sort of based off of you? There's a myth going around about that. We were visited by the research team for the Top Gun movie. They some uh, screenplay people and directors came and spent oh, two weeks at our squadron and I had that call sign and that that helmet and everything and then they made the movie and then when the movie came out it had Iceman in it whether it had any relation to me I have no idea but I can tell you that it totally ruined the call sign <laughs> <laughs> this is Radio Birdman and you're watching TV yeah.
sweat, glory, a little bit of blood, yeah. not too much. Chaos and mayhem. It's kind of a free for all, like, you know, if someone has the, the guts, the balls to bring up a song, you can. Chaos and Mayhem's part of it, but see, there's also, you know, we also don't have a good show when it's all Chaos and Mayhem, so we also like to nail some parts really heavy. And pretty much every single person has to agree on whether something's good or not, which is why it takes so long to write stuff. If one person says they don't like it, then we're all pretty, we have pretty, um, you know, fragile egos, you know, yeah. and we're just like, well, whatever, fine, I'm not gonna use that riff then. Chasney kicking somebody out. Sometimes we play games where we try to like kick the other person's pedals out and they don't have any sound and stuff in the middle of an important part for them. I don't think there's ever been like a, a serious thought of what, like a, like a direction or idea, like we're gonna do this type of record yeah. or that. But it always is kind of, uh, it's always kind of default. Yeah, I think everybody feels a little better when they you know, have difficult parts or parts that they're like not so confident in and everyone comes together and really hits those hard.
battlefield of the cosmic unconsciousness. Oh, Jesus! <laughs> cosmic unconsciousness? Is that yes. like a trick phrase that Rebo means man. like... The example he uses is, you'll be thinking about a plate of shrimp, and then someone will say plate or, or shrimp. shrimp. So what are our options? Defenders. Aggressors, defenders, or revolutionaries. What are you defending? Killer jams, dude. Mm, I like what you're saying. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah, you know, and on. there's been killer jams before. We're just trying to do killer jams too. I'll pass. Digging the latrine holes in yeah. the cosmic battlefield. <laughs> Anything that has to do with a movement or something exceptional that you want to hold on to and try to maintain, you know, even if it's in the cosmic unconsciousness, and especially if it's in the cosmic unconsciousness, that's something that you need to be a defender, an aggressor, and a revolutionary. You Ooh. need all those aspects. You can't just be one. If you're, you know, any one of those things can be beat so easily. They're brittle on their own. I like that, I like that. Dead Moon! Dead Moon. Garage punk band. Fred is a walking legend. He's one of the last people who lived it. He was in uh, the same studio when, uh, when Janis Joplin died. Rock and roll, the, the true original sense of the word. It's not rebellion for the rebellion, but rebellion because they think this is the right way to do it. Very few people that were like in bands in the 60s that understood punk rock. I met Tootie. You got your wife? <laughs> yep, yeah, he's been married for 34 years, yeah. We got like six grandkids right now. <laughs> At first she was just, okay, I'm just standing here and playing my bass. And then over time, she's writing songs, she's doing half the singing, she's prowling the stage. It doesn't matter if you're 30 years old and you think you're past your prime or you're 35, or you're 40, or whatever. It's like, this is the point in your life when you should do that shit. It goes a little something like this. I'm doing my best to like, slay it. I'm a slay. Remember that, kids. What, yeah, what do you gotta say about that, huh? Whatever, you know? So a warlock recorded the record, is that yeah. <laughs> Make some drinks and, you know, get the tape rolling. Just fucking mold the riff. People that just play Boots whatever they bad. want to play and it don't matter. They use it as clay and then they mold their own sugar bowls and teacups. All right, so let me. Uh, Get that man a beer. I got one. We're here in uh, Los Angeles in uh, 2005, the Nitty Factory. Hater, Ben Shepard's trip. Met Ben a few years ago up in Seattle. He introduced me to Bubba. I got a gig playing guitar for Moby for a couple years, right, which is which seems that. like a strange fit. Opened up for Soundgarden overseas. Ben, turns out, is a big Void fan, and <laughs> Kim knew about him as well. Realized it was that oh, Bubba, and we oh, we just started oh, started hanging out. And then I said, and if Hater ever if got back together, yep. I'd love to play play yep. drums. And about six months ago, I got a call out of the blue.
Influences, bro. Influences? It was probably mostly in a Pat Smear and Brian James at that point. Uh, yeah, the damned and the germs. I was a little kid when I heard the Ramones. I was eight or nine. My older brothers and his friends, those guys would roll up on their skateboards. One guy, Jeff Wallace, would play Ramones songs and Devo songs on a fucking harmonica. <laughs> favorite band of all time. Really? They were your favorite band? I wouldn't be here. Are you shitting me? They're your favorite band. Come on, Ben. I'm not shitting. Dude, I wouldn't be sitting here right now if it wasn't for the Ramones. Speaking of the Ramones, that's... Pretty much how I learned to play drums. I'm I, now I'm more obsessed with with Ron Ashton. I just love that fucking that caveman groove, man. When I was a kid, it was all about Void, and it was very intense. <laughs> void, Void. For those of viewers who don't know, it's all about Void. Well, it's no secret that Void was always just a heavy metal band that couldn't play. Bubba pretty much changed the sound of hard. Yeah, hard. yeah. It's pretty far removed from me at this point. I mean, that's 25, what, years ago? Right. And Void was a band that came out of Maryland, correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, Columbia. I vaguely even remember it, quite frankly. Uh, Ian Mackay produced their uh, split, split vinyl in 81. Uh, Yes, I 1981 right, yeah. with uh, with with Faith. I had a uh, an MXR double distortion into this little Univox combo and a cheap ass white Strat copy, <laughs> <laughs> and that was that was it. And that's all that all that nifty stuff is just because I had no choice. Yeah. I, it fed back because that's what it did. What what motivates you guys? Keep why are you guys why are you guys keep doing it? What's up? To be questioned is the crime of which we're not accustomed to. <laughs> <laughs> Had I known. I'm too much of a pussy to blow my brains out, so this is this is what you get, man. It's No, I really I got I got no choice. Yeah. I honestly I've tried to stop a lot. I know it's wrong, but I just keep doing it. I can't I can't stop. Oh well, I'm I'm part of the club. <laughs> exactly. You know, man. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Wine and rock you know, I'm having a good time. <laughs> is that a rap? Greg and I ended up living in LA at the same time and decided to jam and play music again. It started off as a sort of a tribute or an uh, homage to Earth. And so it was like, okay, well, we're sons, <laughs> you know, playing uh, in, this, in, the, in the vein of Earth. Yes, it was our amplifier of choice. Steven and I have been friends for a really long time and we're on the same page with aesthetic and tone. The sun, we really try to have our expectations are always pretty you know, low or non-existent because it's really cool to have things just happen. We did one week of shows in England supporting Goatsnake. I couldn't handle it, so I basically hid behind the amps. I spent the entire tour behind the amps. I was having a hard time getting into the mindset that I wanted and kind of just trancing out and going in with the sound because I was kind of a little bit too worried with what the audience was thinking. And Steve's sister is a seamstress, and she had this idea of, like, I can make you guys these robes. The idea was kind of actually birthed by Julian Cope. He wrote about one of our records and went off on the Druid trip and uh, the megalithic aspect of one way of looking at sound and, and riffs. The purpose of those robes is to uh, sort of bring all the players onto the same playing field. We wanted it to be like more like just sort of an event. You know, we had this idea, like, oh, that's, let's make it a subsonic ritual. It creates a sense of ceremony between the players beyond playing music together. We're at a Vast Studios in Seattle, Washington. What are we doing here? Now mixing, Greg drunk, drunk in. Steven uh, Wakahori. Sorry. 
<laughs> you can't say again. <laughs> we decided to make a record with Boris, who is a, a Japanese artist that we have a lot of respect for. A lot of bands, when they do this kind of thing, it's like, oh, I've got, you know, I've got this finished song, here's how it goes. This was actually like a really true collaborative effort. Yeah, your ideas mm -hmm. and our ideas yeah. Yeah. together. Yeah. Create yeah. new idea. That was the most in-depth collaboration we actually had done. No rehearsals at all. We went into the studio, sat in a room together, conceptualized, wrote, and then recorded a record. There would be someone who would sort of like plant the seed and you know, take the reins and guide it, but there's opportunity for anyone to sort of step into that position. We maybe ran through the idea for 20 minutes and then it was like, boom, it's on tape. Letting the sound be the, the directive. It's kind of like this, this ball of clay that we created and then when we went and did the mixing, we actually even kind of molded it more. Why don't we try starting, Start a fire. It, starting it with the vocals and the guitars right off the bat and then the bass comes in. Hold on, check it out. Try it. Instead of having it come in with guitars for a while and then the vocals, have the vocals and guitars started. What's your favorite part of this collaboration uh -huh. so far? Steven's piano. <laughs> Is this good to do this interview now when we're both drunk? I think we're on camera right see, now. See, that's why. We uh, invited Kim to uh, play some music on our record. So why, why are we here? What's your involvement? My involvement? Um, why am I here? <laughs> I grew up in Seattle, so I'm, it's kind of like a homecoming to me. Dylan from Earth plays on the record, uh, Joe Preston. Um, Bill Herzog is a really old friend of ours. He's on the record. Uh, Rex Ritter. To me, one of the most interesting songs on the record is the song with the vocalist Jesse Sykes. I, I asked Greg, and I was like, "So, are you guys serious about this?" And I, and he's like, "Yeah, man." And I was like, "But, like, you know, I'm, I sing this sort of country folky stuff." And he's like, "Yeah, but it's dark, man. It's dark." And I was just like, "All right." It sounds nothing like Son. I mean, it's like the. <laughs> You know, the, the polar opposite in some ways. It's a quiet song, pretty, it almost kind of has like a dark countryish vibe. It felt like a lullaby, like a really slow, dirgy lullaby. What do you think of uh, Jesse Sykes' vocals? My, my, my heart. Yeah. Very... Yeah. It, uh, goosebumps. Goosebumps? Yeah, we call it uh -huh. goosebumps when uh, your, your skin gets uh -huh. yeah, yeah. tingly. Yeah. Tingly. the break-ins. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm trying I to break in and then it just tears it open. Because the first part of the track has this very yeah. dreamy, yeah. Yeah. you know, and then all of a sudden it's like yeah. bad vibes. What vibe? Yeah. Bad trip. Uh -huh. uh, I'm, I'm enjoying about the bad trip. I think it'd be great to do a set with drums, because we've never done that. For some reason, Sun has worked more with waves, I guess. <laughs> sort of incorporating rhythm that way, oscillation, dissonance. It might also be cool to have both bands on stage and just go for it without any sort of rules. We've already done a lot of stuff with Atsuo. He's done um, quite a few shows with us where he was uh, the vocalist. That was all improvisation. Mm -hmm. 